can come together and do this again so that we can be edified. And I really want to let you guys know that despite our distance from one another, it, it still feels good to be a part of this. And I appreciate Travis and all the work he puts into making the, the technology work. Uh, everyone should definitely shake his hand and give him a pat on the back because you know, through this whole process, it's it's been a challenge to make sure that we can still encourage one another, meet with one another. But due to uh, God giving him wisdom in this regard, we've been able to do things like this. So today, we're going to talk about restoration because uh, restoration is a, 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 an important idea. It's a, an idea that we can see through the Old Testament. If we look at it, we can see it in various places. If we come through the accounts of the, the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah, we can see how some of them restored the land back to what God wanted them to do. Oftentimes, they would restore the land by getting rid of what they call Asherahs. Asherahs are female versions of a god. And so you can have an Asherah of a god called Baal. Some of you have heard that before, called Baal or, or Baal. And that god is a god in which uh, people would sacrifice their children to. A female version or a wife version of, of that god. And the, the kings would come into the land once God has has given them the, the power and the knowledge or the motivation and the they would just wipe away the temples. They would wipe away the altars so that there would be restoration of the land and bringing the people back to what God wanted them to be. And, and in, in light of this idea of restoration, I wanted to have one of our, our very own come and give us a little bit of a talk about the idea of restoration um, from a physical perspective, as you can see on, on the television there, there is a vehicle. Now, unfortunately, there, there was another vehicle that also was a, an older vehicle and it somehow got covered up with this map. But there's supposed to be two vehicles, one being an older version of the new one you see here. But I, I have no doubt that uh, our brother is going to come up and give you guys a really good idea of what this restoration is here in a moment. So without further ado, Brother Bill, if you would come up before us and talk to us about restoration. Well, I had an idea years ago about building a car. And I turned around and saved all my money through all the years and put this plan together and working on this. And it come about I went down to Boomville, Arkansas, and I bought this 1941 Willys that it's just a fiberglass body that I uh, bought the frame to go with it and that. And we started working on this project. It was about a seven year project to do all this. And as we went through this, that uh, we turned around and uh, started out with a a fiberglass body come out of the mold and that, then it brung it up here, and we took it over to uh, Mark Grimes' shop, and we turned around and uh, started preparing this thing for paint. So anyway, as we went along, we got got it all primered and, and, and got it up in that. Then I had my brother come back here from California, and he painted the car for me. And as I'm seeing this project going to putting putting together in that, it, it really got exciting, interesting, and to see this thing actually happen. Then, in, then in the next picture over there, you see me sitting in it, and what they were doing is measuring me for my steering wheel and putting all the gauges. I had a guy who had to cut all the stuff out for me in that. So anyway, we <clears throat> we got down to that point, and. Uh, I was really getting excited, and uh, we turned around and I uh, had a lot of help with this project because I'm not, this is the first project I've ever done. I'm not new to the world of rod and custom and that because my brother does that kind of work when he was alive. 
So anyway, I learned a lot going through this and that. And as you can see, <clears throat> we got the engine in it and tires, wheels, frame, and all that kind of good stuff. And, 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 and as more as you get along with this thing, it's just, wow, this is, you know, you can't sleep at night. You want to get back on this project and get it going in that. So anyway, we got everything done, painted, got the motor, the tranny, the rear end, tires, brakes, and I had to take the frame and had it powder coated. Then I had to put this whole thing back together. And I've never done that in my life. I rebuilt motors and stuff like that, or trannies and that. I'm pretty knowledge knowledgeable about that. But to do a project like this, it's just totally incredible in that. So anyway, it comes on down to the final where I got it home. It went to many car shows. It's won everything that I can totally imagine. And I was just, wow, this is this is unbelievable. Jerry knows about the car. He's been around it. And uh, But anyway, I end up selling the car and had it for about 14 years, I believe. We sold the car, built another project. I started another project. But anyway, when you really get down to the whole thing is, when I look at this car, <clears throat> I look at my life. And, and this, that car is about as perfect that you can imagine by winning trophies, plaques, and all that kind of good stuff. But I want my life to, to turn around and be this way. I want to have the shiny and how that outside. I want my life to be that way. So people can see that being a Christian, it is a great life. And, and you can't go wrong. And, and the bottom line is we got hope for heaven someday. That's the whole goal in that. So that's sort of my little story in that. And uh, like I say, Jerry knows a lot about it in that. And uh, I'm pretty, been pretty fortunate to build two dream cars. But without God's help, I couldn't do anything. <laughs> you know, it's the way it is and that. But anyway, that's sort of my little story. And uh, I feel very thankful that I'm sitting up here right now you know, turn around and talk to G and that, and I hope you get something out of this. But the main goal is, is heaven. That's my main goal. So. Lesson's yours. Lesson. All right. Thank you. you Thank you. So, I, that is a very good illustration, everyone, of uh, what it means to have restoration of something. Because it definitely takes work. It takes uh, taking what we see as uh, maybe beaten down and rusted and, and, and not operating appropriately and then taking whatever's there and gutting it out and, and removing things and being uncertain about some things and, and just moving forward with that, with that process. The process of... You know, just taking things out, putting things in, working things out to make it look good in our life, uh, not for the sake of man, but for the sake of God, and really coming out to to be what that, that picture wonderfully illustrated, which is, in, in a sense, shining, right? Uh, <clears throat> shining for God. We, uh, we can definitely be lights in our walk with God as long as we work to re make restorations in our life. But we're going to go to a text in 2 Kings chapter 18, verses 3 through 7. And we're going to look at a, a few details of a brief restoration that happened with King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah. So to give you some context while you're turning your page, King Hezekiah was a king that came after King Solomon. So he came in the... the the divided kingdom, and what that means is a kingdom that was uh, present after and before they went into Babylonian captivity. So that gives you a little bit of context of where the time frame is at. Let's look at the text, uh, 2 Kings chapter 18, verses 3 through 7. 
Verse 3, it reads, He did right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. He removed the high places and broke down the sacred pillars and cut down the Asherah. He also broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made for until those days, the sons of Israel burn incense to it. It was called the Nehoshitim. Okay? So now we have the beginning stages of, of a restoration process. Now, I know that I'm making a spiritual application to this text. This, this text does not necessarily deal with us today but like the 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 bible says that we can use the old testament text to teach us things to give us examples of things and so notice in this process of restoration that he had to get rid of things he had to break down things he had to destroy things and sometimes we have to do that too don't we it says in in the book of matthew most of us know this that that when we have sin in our lives, if we have to chop off our hand, we have to pluck out our eye. It is better that we do that and to enter into where we need to go heaven lame than to go into hell with our full body. And sometimes we have to look into our life and see if there is some type of idol, some type of place or something that we are worshiping. Now, I know that there's a at least in my life and perhaps in other people's lives, there's a disconnect. There's a disconnect between what is an idol. I mean, we look at the text and what do we see? We see physical things. We see an Asherah. We see the bronze serpent that they made and they put incense on, which was wrong. Now, for those of you that don't know what this is, the bronze serpent, the bronze serpent was, at, in the beginning, it was something that God commanded Moses to do. He told him to make a bronze serpent because God sent these fiery serpents amongst the people because they were going against the will of God. They were grumbling against him. And so he says, okay, if you make the bronze serpent and the people look at the bronze serpent, they will be healed and they will live. And so uh, over time, evidently, that bronze serpent that Moses made, the people began to to do things with it that were not pleasing in the sight of God by burning incense on it and turning it into something that it wasn't. But it's things like that, turning something into something that it's not supposed to be. Well, we we have we have a good example of, of restoring something, but also think of a car, right? You can make a car your idol. Can you not? I mean, there are some people that they, rather than... Uh, spending time with their their wife and their children they want to spend time on their car you know god calls us husbands to be uh carers of our wife and carers of our children by bringing them up in the discipline of the lord well what about what about our jobs can you make your job something that is more of an idol yes you can you can make your job uh, uh, above and beyond the things that you know you need to do. Yes, God calls us to work. He calls us to work with our hands, doing that which is good, so we can provide for those who are in need. And he calls us to work with our hands, minding our own business, First Thessalonians, so that we can mind our own business and not be in need from any outsiders. But we can take it further than that. We can make it something like being a workaholic, right, where we should be working to uh, evangelize. We should be working to edify our brethren when they have a hard time, when they're depressed, when they're sad, when they're, when they're angry about something, reaching out to them. We can put things above and beyond what they should be, not putting them in the proper context in our life. But in addition to that, <clears throat> there's a passage in Ephesians, uh, Ephesians chapter 5, that talks about uh, what idolatry amounts to. Idolatry amounts to covetousness. Covetousness is really wanting things that are forbidden by God. Now, you may not find that definition uh, in, in, your, in your lexicons or, 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 in other words, a dictionary of sorts, but that's the contextual definitions that I see. And so you will find 
that coveti covetousness is wanting something that it's forbidden by God. Now, here's here's a good example. Thing, I have a wife. Okay, I'm married. I just got married uh, recently, a little little less than a year. Now, I'm allowed to have my wife. Okay, I'm being real with you guys, I'm allowed to have my wife. God says I'm allowed to have her, but can I desire another woman? No, that's not appropriate. That is forbidden in the sight of God. I'm allowed to have other things, right? I'm allowed to have my my apartment, my my car, my whatever the case may be, but then am I allowed to desire the, the things that belong to someone else? No, I'm not. And so you just got to put things in the right frame of thinking when it comes to uh, uh, covetousness and idolatry and doing the will of God so that we can know. And I'll even say this. I don't know if there's uh, many, many people here, but I know that when I was going through Bear Valley, there was a number of people that were gamers, right? I'm, I used to be a gamer when I was growing up. I used to play uh, fighting games, and that was my thing. I used to play to my thumbs would get blisters on them, in fact. And I would keep playing. I'd get all the cheat codes, and I'd be really excited about about the game. And I, and I dedicated myself to that for a long time. But then uh, the question is, can that become more of uh, an idol, not putting it in its proper context? I'm not saying gaming is wrong. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that you can make it your your refuge. You can make it your uh, your comfort zone in which you, rather than going to God as your the, the God of our comfort and, and going to him to answer your, your, your struggles in life, you go to this game or you go to uh, whatever the case may be, putting it in the place of God. So putting things in their proper framework is very important. In addition, we see another aspect of um, restoration, but let's, let's ask yourself something. I want you to just think with me. Uh, about these statements. When I am happy, the first thing I think to do is what? The thing that brings me the most comfort, what I am sad, that helps me get through is what? Every day, I spend the most time yeah. Yeah. I want you to, in your mind, think of those things and fill in the blank and really reflect on them because depending on what those answers are, you might find that you have idolatry in your life. You might find that you're taking the place of God. Now, I heard many years ago that uh, Americans in general, they spend more time watching TV. They almost spend as much time watching television as they do working or sleeping. Believe that or not. Six to eight hours a day, someone can sit down and watch television. And you got to ask yourself, is that really what God wants for your life? Again, television is not wrong, but are you putting it above and beyond the will of God to make it an idol in your life? The second spiritual lesson that we're going to look at today from the text is found in verse number five. Chapter 18, verse five. Blessed is the Lord, the God of Israel, so that after him there was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor among those who were before him. He clung to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments which the Lord had commanded Moses. So again, this is in the context of the Old Testament. And so, of course, the commands that he needs to follow are the ones that were given to Moses on the Mount mountain of Sinai and to Joshua and to other people along that uh, path in history. But notice what he did. He, he clung to God as part of his the restoration process. 
And I like that to the restoration process because let's let's think about it in a physical sense. Let's go back to the, the car that Bill gave. Let's get a picture of you take the things out of that car. You gut that car of all that that old bad stuff that you don't want to use anymore. Now what do you have left? You have really nothing left but the frame of that car, the, the essence of that car. And so if you take the stuff out of your life, you get rid of that television, you get rid of something, you get cut off your hand, you do the drastic thing, you get rid of that, that computer. Say if you're dealing with a pornography issue, if you're dealing with a, a shopping addiction, if you're dealing with making your wife, think about this. If you're doing dealing with thinking about making your wife an idol, I'm not saying you get rid of her, <laughs> understand that, but sometimes you got to do things a little bit drastic that I have to communicate and set time aside to talk about things, but you have God left, right? You get rid of that, which is bad, and you have God left. He was always there, but now you see him clearly because you've gotten rid of some things and you start to cling to him. You start to draw near to him and closer to him. You can start building that relationship that you need to have. Just like Hezekiah did. He clung to him and, and held fast to his, his commandments. And just grab onto it so that you can you can start to grow a new relationship. Now there's definitely this, this contrast between running to the idols and, and running to God. God calls, calls us all to be one that Near to him, that learn his will. All these can be found in the passages in, in James. Uh, we can find this in Ephesians. We can see the example of Paul in the Philippians. We can see uh, the Thessalonians. Look at First Thessalonians taking up this example where they they held fast to the word of God, and it was able to help them. The word of God is able to save our souls. But one way that we can also fill our lives with him is to pray more pray without ceasing doesn't it say that in the book of first thessalonians uh and then that's in philippians <laughs> i was about to go to thessalonians which one a class that i had a while back but we are to do that in our lives and it's a hard thing to do at times but we are called to do that god wants our minds god wants all of our attention and he is a jealous god at that but we need to make sure that we practice a level of, of discernment so that we can understand what is expected from us. Let, it, let us see a, another point in the text. If we were to, you don't have to turn there, but if you were to go to Genesis chapter 12, verses 5 through in chapter 13, verse 1, what you're going to find is an example of how we are to be better discerners. Now, why is this important? Because if we're going to hold fast to God, if we're going to grow in our knowledge, we have to be able to study his word well. And you don't have to read it right now if you don't want to, but I'm just going to go over it and, and review. So the text deals with Abraham, Sarah, and, and Lot. So those are people that uh, God had called to do something. There was a famine in the land, and Abraham, Sarah, were in the land of Canaan. They went up to Egypt because of this famine. Now then, time had gone by, and then... Abraham, Sarah, and Lot came back. And what the text doesn't say is that Lot went up to Egypt. But evidently, because he came back, at some point he went up. You see? That is uh, what do you call an inference. An inference is when you when you look at something and it has to be the case because of the, the information. I'll give you another example. It's not a textual example, but it's just a physical example, a square. If I were to say that you have a square and 
I said one side of that square is four inches. And so then I said the other sides must be four inches. You can know that is absolutely true because it's a square. But I didn't tell you every side was four inches. So it's things like that in the text that we can learn to understand just by reading it and growing our knowledge of the will of God. So let's look at a third spiritual lesson that we can learn from the text. Verse number seven. And the Lord was with him wherever he went, he prospered. And he rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. Okay, it may not be apparent as to what this is talking about, but the spiritual lesson that we can glean from this is the fact that he refused against the will of God, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria. He learned that. He learned that he chose to do the will of God over doing the evil thing. This relates to the, the process of us restoring our lives because you have to get rid of something. Then you have to cling to God, and then you have to refuse to go back into that thing. you got to refuse to deal with the evil in this context, you have King Hezekiah who refused to get back into the evil things, right? And so we can do the same thing. But doesn't it happen that if you have friends that are involved in that evil thing that you're doing or that idolatrous thing that you're doing, and you automatically cut that off, you stop, what are they going to be like? Hey, man, what are you doing Saturday? You want to come over and... um. You want to you want to you want to get drunk. You want to take a couple back. You want to hang out. Hey, you want to go watch that, that that wrong video? You know what I mean? That immoral video with me? People do that. They try to pull you back into that because they think that's who you are. Or you might have new people in your life. They may try to convince you to do things. I had a had a gentleman I, I was working with. And as, as we know, all Christians should be mindful of their thoughts. And he was trying to pull me into really looking at the women at my job in a very immoral way. He was trying to coax me into it. And I had to tell him, no, that's not right, man. And, and sometimes you got to just refuse to do the things that are evil in, in front of them because they can easily draw you back in. And even if it's in your own household, you got to do these things. If it's between your husband or between your wife and between your kids, you got to let them know this is where you stand and you refuse to do that. Because as we grow as Christians, we got to stand in the truth as opposed to standing in what is wrong in our life. Now, that was a lesson on restoration and sometimes you you don't realize what is going on in your life that needs to be restored so wonderfully like bill did the vehicle but the text tells us if you were to flip to a text like the book of galatians let's turn turn with me there I, I've, I've referenced this before, um, but it is a very good text to, to turn to for your sake. Galatians, about chapter 5, verse 17. Now, it, the, the text, the Holy Spirit, God is revealing to, to us the things that are of the flesh. In this context, in this book, really, we have uh, a, a number of key words. We have um, the law versus faith. We have the flesh versus spirit. Okay, the things of the flesh are obviously not pleasing to God. I think we can all agree with that. And the things of the spirit are the things that are pleasing to God. But if you were to go through this list here, 
and really uh, study some of these ideas and see how they are applied with various examples. You can definitely look at the Old Testament and see a lot of these examples. But these are the things of the flesh that God is not pleased with in which we can turn into idolatry. Like, uh, well, for instance, we can, we can even do verse number 20, just by way of example. Uh, look at, some of you may have something else there. Um, the word is pharmakia. All right. It just it just means drugs. If you want to simply put it, it means drugs. And we know that our there are some that that take drugs in their life and they abuse them. Now, it's the use of the drug. We can have an aspirin. You can have uh, other things, right? But it's the abuse of the drug that becomes a problem. And you can make that your your refuge. You can make that the thing that is taking the place of God. Uh, there's other things like like uh, factions, you know, causing causing division among your own household. A house divided can't stand. Jesus said that he was talking in in context to uh, him casting out the demon, and the people were talking to him about how. He is uh, Beelzebub, right? But the the principle still applies that you, if you have divisions in your house and someone is causing the strife, and you lean to that understanding, which is the wisdom of the world, it's going to cause problems in your household. But again, you can go through this and look at what is contrary to the will of God, what is needed uh, in your life to get rid of as part of your restoration process. But know that in this process, you gotta you gotta replace it with something. You can't just leave an empty hole in your life with what you're doing. God gives us plenty of things to replace that that with. He gives us some things of the spirit. He gives us the things that please Him, rather than uh, filling your life with the material things. Fill your life with the spiritual things. So I hope this lesson was edifying to you um, to help you understand what it takes to. Uh, make these changes, but know that this stuff is not going to come overnight. I mean, I, I admit I'm a, I'm a man that sometimes um, I lack patience. I lack patience with myself and I lack patience with other people. I'm just being honest with you. And what it takes time sometimes is taking the small steps to get rid of what you need to get rid of. And you might have to be very systematic about it. You might have to write it down. You might have to talk to another person. You might need an accountability partner, even in the smallest things. Like, I'm again, I'm going to be honest with you. I I, I need uh, help with being a, a gentle person, not in the sense of like physical, but in the sense of my words and my language. Um, uh, be gentle and not push, push people so hard. And I've, I've taken some people that are, I believe, are faithful Christians in my life to uh, monitor me because they are a, a party outside of outside of my own head. You know what I mean? And they can see me at times, and they can uh, hold me accountable to being a more gentle person. And I love them, and I appreciate them for that. And, um, I'm slowly making these changes to to have that in my life. So you can do things like that to make this restoration possible for yourself. A foreign concept is actually something that God calls us to do. And if you look in the, in the book of Galatians, um, chapter, chapter 6, verse 2, it says, Bear one another's burdens, thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Okay? And so we are called to encourage one another, bear each other's burdens, to help each other out. And again, we are we are family, and it's it's good to be here as, as a family of believers uh, brethren, that includes sisters, don't neglect yourself in that statement. It's just those who think of like minds. And I, it's good to see everyone here. Um, and I hope that uh, I can come see you guys soon after everything uh, is done. So without further ado, if, um, if, all, if we want to stand and sing, let us let us do that now.